Hey folks, Eric Stackelbeck here. Welcome to a Watchman Newscast live stream on your Monday afternoon. Big news here, I believe. Hamas is losing control of Gaza finally after, oh gosh, some 16, 17 years of brutal, wicked, diabolical, iron-fisted rule by Hamas in Gaza. Israel's defense minister, Yoav Galan, said today that yes, Hamas is losing control of Gaza and taking major losses all around. Uh, Gallant paints a picture of Hamas in disarray, with many of their terrorists now fleeing and fleeing south, presumably alongside Gazan civilians who are also evacuating to the south. But command and control centers, all of this now, Hamas command and control centers, all of this now is in the IDF site. So we're going to break that down today. The state of play in Gaza right now, and perhaps this campaign, which, look, will certainly stretch on for a bit, no doubt, but many were saying, and a lot of times we hear these doom and gloom predictions, right? Every time that a, a Western power, in particular the U.S. or a Western ally like Israel, uh, goes into a particular country to carry out a military operation in the mainstream media, it's synonymous that they all conclude it will be a quagmire. That is always the assessment of the mainstream media, doom and gloom, not only in military operations, but think back to 2017, for instance, December 2017, when then President Trump announced that the U.S. was going to move its embassy to Jerusalem. The world howled and gnashed its teeth. The mainstream media said that this decision would set the Middle East on fire. Well, number one, in case you haven't noticed, the Middle East has been on fire for some time now, try century upon century. And number two, it never happened. The Middle East was not set ablaze anew by the U.S. Embassy moving to Jerusalem. How do I know? Because I was there at the grand opening of the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem back in May 2018. But you get an idea. Look, before Israel went into Gaza, I read many pieces, analysis pieces saying, man, Israel doesn't know what it's getting into. They're in big trouble when they go into Gaza. And I'm not saying it's not a severely fierce fight. And it's it's horrific on many levels what the IDF is facing. No doubt Hamas, as Yoav Gallant has called it in recent days, was the world's biggest terror base ever, basically, in his words. Booby trap, Hamas fighters waiting. But the IDF, I think it's indisputable, folks, is making great gains right now in Gaza and perhaps even more and at a, a quicker pace with less casualties than were expected at the outset. Now, over 40 Israeli soldiers have been killed in this operation. Every fatality, every injury even is obviously horrible and we mourn for them. But the numbers that were projected were much higher. Let's just say that. So by the grace of God, Israel making large gains with, with not a massive amount of casualties so far in this operation in Gaza. And here's a few more specifics. And also today, before we are through, we want to get into the situation to the north. Once again, and in case you missed our newscast on Saturday, yes, we came to you for a special weekend edition of the Watchman Newscast. Just check it out here in our archives under newscast on the homepage. We broke down the latest speech by Hezbollah leader Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah. That's right. He gave a speech last Friday. He also gave a speech this past Saturday, two speeches in an eight-day span. And these may be among Nasrallah's last speeches if things keep moving in the direction I think they may be moving in in terms of Israel and Hezbollah. More on that in a minute. And a quick reminder, I mentioned you can check out any videos you missed here in our archives. Hey, while you're there, if you like what you're hearing, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell so you get alerts every time a new video is posted. We'd love to have you with us every day as watchmen and women on the wall for such a time as this. I also want to talk today about what's happening in the U with the U.S. right now in the Middle East U.S. forces have been attacked by Iranian proxies four times in the past 24 hours or so. I'm coming to you around 4 p.m. Eastern time here in the United States, but four times in the span of 24 hours. And that, I think, puts the overall amount of attacks since October 7th against U.S. forces 
in Iraq and Syria, courtesy of those Iran-backed proxies and militias, at least, I believe, 50 such attacks, rockets, drones, missiles, launched at various U.S. bases in Iraq and Syria since October 7th. So clearly, the U.S. airstrikes, sporadic U.S. airstrikes, which have been carried out mainly in eastern Syria against Iranian-backed installations there and Iran proxy installations there. Clearly, Iran and its proxies aren't getting the memo. And the deterrent factor there is no deterrent because Iran keeps attacking. We're ordering its proxies to attack. So we'll break that down as well. But let's stick right now with the state of play, as I mentioned, in Gaza. Uh, number one, Yoav Gallant says, look, Hamas has lost control. We had Israeli soldiers, and the pictures are up online, taking control of the parliament in Gaza today and hoisting the Israeli flag there in victory in the parliament. Gallant says they're in disarray. They're fleeing south. They've lost control. Uh, and Gaza right now, folks, is split in half. Just so you know, a pretty ingenious military maneuver and strategy by the Israel Defense Forces where they have isolated northern Gaza which is obviously home to Gaza City, Hamas's main power base. They have told civilians now for the better part of the past five weeks to flee northern Gaza, evacuate, get out of here because we are coming in and we don't want any civilian casualties. Even in war, we, we want to minimize absolutely any civilian casualties. So Israel time and time again, and by the way, Israel has no obligation to do this. Uh, it, it's fighting a war in Gaza. Hamas is the governing, if you can call it that, governing force, or at least it was. Now that's all collapsing, thankfully. In Gaza, the welfare of the people of Gaza, first and foremost, should be the responsibility of the governing force there, right? Well, that's not how Hamas sees it. Hamas sees civilians as a means to an end and uses them as a crucial, crucial part, folks. Don't forget of their battle strategy in that they literally use women, children, and the elderly as human shields. How noble of Hamas. Uh, but here's what Yoav Gallant said. As, again, split in two, many civilians have fled south and northern Gaza is isolated. Let me pull this up right now from Yoav Gallant. Have the article pulled, just trying to find it for you. Here's what I want to get to, actually. Uh, Gallant said, look, we're isolating command and control structure, infrastructure, etc. They're in disarray, but this is one I really want to get to you. Now, we've talked often here on the live stream uh, over the past few weeks about Hamas, how Hamas, and I just mentioned it a minute ago, but Hamas uses civilian areas, civilian infrastructure, buildings, et cetera, uh, as a, basically as command and control centers and places from which they can launch rockets. They intentionally position rocket launchers, and other military structures within civilian buildings and alongside civilian buildings. Last week, the Israel Defense Forces found rocket launchers next to a kindergarten. Now, why does Hamas do this? And believe me, I have a point here I'm about to quote directly about what's happening at one hospital in particular in Gaza, a smoking gun of how Hamas uses hospitals to station military hardware and to launch attacks from. But why does Hamas do this? And this bears repeating. Because we've got trolls here on the live stream and uh, trolls all over the place, pro-Palestinian, anti, I should say pro-Hamas, because that's really what they are, uh, anti-Semitic, anti-Israel trolls who would tell you that Israel is a war criminal and intentionally targeting civilians. No troll will answer this because they're not intellectually honest and it's not about, it's not, it, it's all rage and anger and venom and emotion. It's not based on facts. The arguments of these pro-Hamas rallies, including right here in the United States, where hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands, well, at least hundreds of thousands in London over the weekend, tens of thousands nationwide here in the U.S., their arguments are never based on facts on the ground. It's always emotion, bile, hatred that comes from some primal place because, folks, at the end of the day, this is a spiritual struggle. We battle not against flesh and blood, but against spirits and principalities. It's a spiritual battle. And a great darkness is descending across the world right now. And you've seen it in the aftermath of October 7th. That was the kind of event that you would think would galvanize the world 
against evil, against Hamas, and for Israel, standing with the Jewish people, it's done quite the opposite. It has galvanized people against Israel. Israel responded to the greatest massacre of the Jewish people, the worst terror attack in Israeli history, Israel's 9-11. Israel responded to the events of October 7th, and Israel is being painted as the aggressor and Hamas as the victim. It's interesting. It, it brings to, it brings to mind the book of Isaiah. I, interesting is maybe not the word. How about horrifying? But a sign of the times. We live in Bible times. We live in prophetic times. By the way, in case you haven't noticed, this is a news channel that's coming to you from a biblical perspective. So it's good to quote Isaiah, who said, Woe to those who put good for evil and evil for good. Folks, that's exactly what we have right now, where people are calling good evil and they're defending evil and labeling evil as good. Hamas is a demonic evil death cult. No gray areas here. Israel has gone to extraordinary lengths to avoid civilian casualties. And by the way, who is ultimately responsible for the civilians in Gaza? the governing body of Gaza, Hamas. And number two, Hamas intentionally used, why are civilians in Gaza dying? Number one, because Hamas launched a horrific attack on October 7th, a bloody murderous terror attack against Israel that Israel had to respond to, to defend the existence of its nation, which is roughly the size of the state of New Jersey. And number two, civilians are dying in Gaza because Hamas is using them as human shields. And because Hamas is preventing them from fleeing for five weeks, Israel has implored the people of Gaza, go south, get out of the line of fire. Hamas has refused to allow them to evacuate. Folks, these are facts I'm giving you. But, but again, all you're hearing is anger, emotion, and irrational, violent thought with no heed paid to facts. You're not going to get that. But why... Does Hamas use hospitals and kindergartens and schools and playgrounds as the very place to set up their command and control centers, at least hospitals, they do that, but to set up their rocket launchers? Because they know that the Israel Defense Forces do everything in their power and then some to the point of at times putting Israeli soldiers in harm's way in order to avoid civilian casualties. Never has any army, any military force, with the exception of the United States, taken such pains to avoid civilian casualties? And again, Israel has no, uh, no responsibility to do that when it comes to Hamas. But Israel, it's interesting. All of the trolls and the pro-Hamas forces. Here's a very interesting point for you that Douglas Murray, who's a great thinker in the UK, he made this point over the weekend, and it was brilliant, and it was so accurate. And, I, hey, we have some trolls here on the chat. I'd love to hear them comment. Where were you when Bashar al-Assad was massacring hundreds of thousands of Muslims, including tens of thousands of children in Syria? Where were you? Where were you in Yemen? when thousands upon thousands were being killed and the, the Iran-backed Houthi rebels were, were killing children? Where have you been? Where are the marches? Where is the accountability for Bashar al-Assad, for the Houthis, for those Iran-backed forces? Where were you when Hezbollah commandeered all of those villages in southern Lebanon and basically is holding the people there hostage and using the villages and the homes in southern Lebanon as a military base from which they can rock, launch rockets. But look, folks, again, Bible times, times where good is called evil, evil is called good. There's a great darkness descending, no doubt, but we will be a light in the darkness here at the Watchmen, and, and I hope you'll join us here, and, and that's the bottom line. The truth will win in the end, as difficult as this is. And for me, I, I'm vexed. When I look out across the world landscape right now and I see what's happening, it, it could be disheartening. But you know what? I do know that God Almighty still sits on the throne, that God, through it all, through all the madness, God is still in control. And if you're like me, I'm saying, Lord, where are you right now? God, show up, Lord. And, and he's going to. He always does in a mighty way 
and justice will be done. But when you see this wave of evil uh, sweeping across the world right now, it's tough to see. It's tough to see. But again, we believe the truth will win out. In the meantime, Israel is in the process of winning out in Gaza. And I want to read from the IDF spokesman, Admiral Daniel Hagari, what he said about Rantizi Hospital in Gaza City. Now, Rantizi Hospital treats children. And according to the IDF, Hamas operatives were holed up there. Surprise, surprise. And underneath the hospital, I'm quoting, he says, in the basement, we found a Hamas command and control center, suicide bomb vest, grenades, AK-47 assault rifles, explosive devices, rocket-propelled grenades, and other weapons, computers, money, etc. We also found signs that indicate that Hamas held hostages there. This is currently under our investigation. And additionally, we found evidence, he said, that Hamas terrorists came back from the massacre in southern Israel on October 7th to this very hospital after butchering Israelis in their homes. Hamas hides in hospitals. Today, we will expose this to the world. They do hide in, in hospitals, and they have dragged some 249, uh, two, I'm sorry, 239 at least, hostages, women, children, the elderly, back to Gaza, where they are in the bowels of hell, uh, practically in these tunnels, this tunnel network beneath Gaza right now. Look, I interviewed, and you saw it here in the newscast last week on an Israel Under Fire special that we did. I interviewed families of the hostages. Folks, these were the most difficult interviews I've ever done. And I want you to join me here in praying for a miracle, a miraculous hostage rescue. This is foremost in the minds of the Israeli troops who are on the ground in Gaza right now, rescuing the hostages. Where are they right now? Praying for a miracle. Look, Genesis 14 talks about Abraham and his men saving Lot from these Canaanite, pagan Canaanite kings, I should say, a miraculous biblical hostage rescue. And 1 Samuel talks about the same, David, King David and his men rescuing women and children who'd been kidnapped by the Amalekites. Folks, God's arm is not too short and he can do this. And we are continuing to pray for a miraculous hostage rescue Hey, let me pause and take a breath. So that's the state of play in Gaza, but let me pause, take a breath, say hello to everyone. We've got thousands watching right now. We'll have thousands more before the time we're done on this Monday in November, Thanksgiving, right around the corner here in the United States. Time is flying in these Bible times that we're living in, but we have people from around the world joining us right now. Hello, everyone. God bless you all. Thanks so much for joining us. Hey, and European Union leaders, even, we're talking about the hospitals, uh, European Union leaders, and by the way, there are reports of Hamas terrorists firing at Israeli soldiers from Al-Shifa Hospital, which is the main hospital in Gaza City, and the main command and control center for Hamas is located beneath that hospital. And Yahya Sinwar, who's probably the most wanted man right now, the leader of Hamas in Gaza, he may very well be beneath Al-Shifa Hospital in Gaza City right now. But the European Union, which I mentioned, is also condemning Hamas's use of hospitals as command and control centers. So when even Europe is coming out and saying, look, Hamas is using hospitals uh, and they're using patients and doctors and nurses as human shields and they're using hospitals as command and control centers. When even Europe, which is usually quick to condemn Israel, is coming out and saying this and condemning Hamas, you know you've got something here, folks. And You've got not only Israel saying this about the hospitals, you've got Europe confirming it, you've got the United States confirming it. This is a well-known, long-established fact that Hamas sets up command and control centers at hospitals. The big showdown is coming at Al-Shifa Hospital, make no mistake about it. And I ask you, and I wonder, I wonder what you think. We've got this lively chat right now, and we're live. Do you think if Israel destroys, or at least occupies and seizes, I should say, the command and control center beneath Al-Shifa Hospital, does that shorten the war? If that's Hamas's main command and control center, does that shorten the war? Now, the Biden administration, including President Biden today, is saying, look, we want to see Israel operate with more tact in the hospitals, et cetera. And he's continuously banging that drum. And it's interesting to me, the Biden administration, European leaders, 
and some really disgraceful comments by Emmanuel Macron, the French president, last Friday. They keep uh, browbeating Israel uh, to observe international law and human rights and about civilian casualties when folks they know very well that Israel is going above and beyond to avoid civilian casualties and to follow the rules of war and to follow international law, even as Israel is fighting an entity, Iran-backed Hamas, which does nothing of the sort, which could care less about Israeli or Palestinian civilian casualties, which could care less about any rules of war or human rights, anything like that. So it's interesting. Israel always held to a different standard, even held uh, continuously, continuously held to a different standard, even than Western nations, the supposedly enlightened secular Western nations. But the EU quick to condemn Israel always. And again, they know, they know, and they've been on the ground. U.S. officials and European officials have been on the ground over the past six weeks in direct uh, talks with their Israeli counterparts, both on the political and military end of things. And they know what Israel's doing. They know the extraordinary lengths Israel is going to to avoid any of this. Civilian casualties, to to stringently follow rules of war, even as they're fighting a force that, that could care less about it. So why are they still saying it then? Why are they still imploring Israel to, to follow the rules of war and humanitarian uh, have humanitarian concern, which Israel does, and then some? Why are they still saying it if they know Israel's doing it? They are paying lip service to their far left, radical left basis. And, the, and that's the bottom line. The radical left today in the United States, I can tell you, was up in arms and condemning Joe Biden to the point where they were protesting outside his home in Delaware over the weekend because he has vocally supported Israel's efforts against Hamas. Now, at the same time, he has vocally continued to pressure Israel incessantly uh, about its campaign, about the way it's conducting its campaign in Gaza. Uh, but his statements, by and large, have been supportive of Israel. There hasn't been a complete throwing of Israel under, under the bus in public yet. I, I hate to say it, but yet by the Biden administration. But behind the scenes, Israel in many ways is fighting with one arm behind its back as the incessant pressure is coming against it by the U.S. Uh, and against Europe. The U.S. is the one that really matters when it comes to Israel, obviously. Uh, but that pressure continues behind the scenes. And the pressure from a premature ceasefire, which would, look, uh, endanger Israel in profound ways if Hamas is left to fight another day. Not only does it embolden Hamas, and does it guarantee that Hamas will strike Israel again? And look, Hamas officials have already been on record. We've got the clips. We've showed them here on, on the newscast on record saying they want to carry out many more October 7th of higher magnitudes of that day. So not only would it embolden Hamas, it would embolden uh, Iran and Hezbollah to attack Israel. And by the way, to attack the United States even more than they already are. And we'll talk about that in a second. In that if Israel, and I don't believe Israel will do this, but if Israel were to agree to a premature ceasefire and call it a day before the job is done, the job of crushing Hamas decisively once and for all so it can never, ever threaten Israel or the world again, if Israel were to do that, the world would see it as caving to U.S. pressure. So by extension, the U.S. would look weak because the world would see it as, wow, OK, Israel stopped before the job was done because the U.S. was on their backs so much and demanding it. So the U.S. would also look like it is not serious about defeating terror decisively. Why? Number one, because Hamas is a vicious terror organization that needs to be destroyed. That's obvious to anyone. But number two, there are at least nine U.S. citizens in Hamas's clutches right now being held captive. So it would have the double whammy, so to speak, of making Hamas or Israel and the U.S. look weak in the face of Hamas and Iranian-backed terror. And that's not a good thing, needless to say, nor is the situation to the north right now. As Hezbollah yesterday launched rockets that killed one Israeli civilian and wounded 20 more who were working on power lines reportedly along the Israel-Lebanon border. 
Israel has struck back, saying it's striking Hezbollah terror infrastructure in Lebanon. Folks, essentially, we've had this tit for tat in the north for several weeks, really since October 7th, where the second front is open. Make no mistake about it. Israel is fighting now on multiple fronts. It is fighting Hezbollah in Lebanon right now, but not all the way, I guess you would say. The second front is open, but not all the way. What would all the way entail? That would mean that Hezbollah unleashes its full arsenal. And its full arsenal includes some 150, at least 150,000 rockets and missiles pointed at every inch of Israel, tens of thousands of well-armed, well-trained, battle-hardened foot soldiers. That's the full Hezbollah arsenal and probably some other tricks up their sleeves that we don't know about, supplied by Iran. And this arsenal also includes a number of precision-guided missiles, PGMs for short, which do exactly what the name says. They're designed to hit the target with greater precision and greater accuracy. And that is the main reason, those PGMs, that Israel has carried out so many airstrikes in Syria over the past several years, looking to eliminate shipments of PGMs and PGM parts transiting from the Iranian regime through Syria into the hands of, you guessed it, Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. So it, the beat goes on to the north where every day there are engagements between Israel and Hamas, or I'm sorry, Hezbollah. At least 71 Hezbollah fighters, terrorists, have been killed since October 7th in these engagements with the IDF. And look, folks, for Hezbollah, those are pretty heavy losses, number one. Number two, we've had at least seven Israeli soldiers killed in these engagements. And as I mentioned a minute ago, at least one Israeli civilian. Uh, two thoughts here. And I want to get your thoughts on this before we close out with the U.S. and what's happening there in Syria and in the region. Two thoughts here for you and, and leave me your thoughts. Number one, does anyone watching right now have any doubt that if Gaza was not on fire right now and if Israel weren't obviously very preoccupied and then some with the events in Gaza and the war there, that if Hezbollah was carrying out the attacks it has carried out over the past six weeks, does anyone have any doubt that Israel, already there would be a full-blown war in the north? Israel would have responded decisively right away, and we'd be well on the way to seeing Hezbollah crushed. And I believe that's the ultimate end game here as well. I believe Hamas will be crushed. I believe Hezbollah is on the road to being no more as well, to no longer pose any sort of significant threat to the state of Israel, bar none. That's coming, which brings me to the second point. I've been asking this every day. Uh, number one, that if you lived in the north, if you lived in northern Israel along that Lebanon border, would you feel comfortable returning right now with Hezbollah still perched across the border at full strength? And with intentions to duplicate October 7th, many magnitudes worse because Hezbollah is much more dangerous than Hamas. And we saw what Hamas did on October 7th. Greatest day of terror in the history of the state of Israel. So are you one of the hundreds of thousands of Israelis overall, but at least tens of thousands evacuated from over 30 communities in the north near the Lebanon border? Are you comfortable actually moving back there? If Hezbollah is still at full strength, folks, I don't think so. I don't think that's happening anytime soon, as Hezbollah is right across the fence in southern Lebanon. At the end of the day, and, and look, Israel talked about this today, about reestablishing the security situation in the north. What does that mean? Well, yesterday, the Israeli military dropped leaflets in southern Lebanon encouraging the citizens of southern Lebanon to flee to north, flee north, get out of the south. Southern Lebanon, again, is Hezbollah's main power base. So they're telling people, look, get out of there. Number two, today, Hertzi Halivi, who is the IDF's chief of staff, said, look, we're going to reestablish security in the, in the north along that Lebanon border. Number three, something else to keep in mind. There are some 360,000 Israeli reservists called up right now. Israel is on war footing. The nation is united. They know that the situation in the north, they know, number one, the greater threat is there with Hezbollah. But secondly, they know the situation in the north is unsustainable. So do the math, folks. Israel is going to have to turn its attention eventually on Hezbollah. The only reason they haven't so far is, number one, they don't want to be stuck fighting on multiple fronts. But number two, the Biden administration reportedly is putting great pressure on Israel 
not to act against Hezbollah and, in their words, broaden the war. Well, guess what? Hezbollah has already chosen to broaden the war. Not again, not in a full scale way, but it seems every day that passes, Hezbollah is becoming more and more bold and they're pushing and they're probing and they're seeing what they can get away with and, and they're starting to really have an impact there. Or they've all, not starting. Look, when you evacuate over 30 communities, they've had an impact over the past six weeks. So how long can Israel accept or live with this absolutely intolerable situation to the north? That's the big question right now, folks. I believe that Israel, look, only I, I think it's under 50 percent of Israel's full military assets are focused on Gaza right now. The bulk of Israel's forces are actually right now focused on the north. And Yoav Gallant said the other day that, look, uh, we have the noses of our fighter jets, he said, are pointed towards the north right now. I think Israel here has a window. You want to call it a golden opportunity? You could call it that to destroy Hezbollah as well, to destroy Hamas and Hezbollah, two existential threats perched on its border. Is Israel right now really going to send all of those reserve when, when the dust settles in Gaza eventually, send all of those reserve soldiers home and try to send the communities, the people of northern Israel, back home along the border of Lebanon with Hezbollah still there at full strength? I don't think they can do it. So I think you're going to see it's coming. I don't know when it's coming, maybe sooner rather than later. The Great Northern War we've been talking about here on the newscast for years now, really, where Israel will be forced to face off against Hezbollah and Iranian assets in Lebanon and next door in Syria as well. And I believe that battle will have serious prophetic connotations, no doubt. And we've talked about that a bunch here on the newscast, but Isaiah 17 and, and uh, a forerunner to the war, Ezekiel's war, the war of Gog and Magog, laid out in the book of Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39. There's Iran's nuclear facilities. And imagine how exposed Iran will feel if both Hamas and Hezbollah are destroyed, in particular Hezbollah folks, because look, if and when, I believe when, Israel strikes Iran's nuclear facilities, Iran's main form or main method of retaliation was going to be Hezbollah. And I believe that's the main reason Iran has held Hezbollah in reserve for the large part, for the better part of 17 years. It was reserving Hezbollah for that day when it needed, really needed to unleash Hezbollah. And that day certainly would be if and when Israel strikes those nuclear facilities. But the big question now is, Hey, it looks like in real time before our very eyes, Hamas is being destroyed. It's in its approaching, at least it seems, its death throes, even though we still are seeing some rockets launched, not nearly where it was, but some rockets still being launched, including a barrage near central Israel and Tel Aviv today out of Gaza. But Hamas seems to be on the road to ruin. And the big question, I've been asking this for weeks here in the live stream, uh, does Iran let that happen? Do Iran and Hezbollah say, you know what, we'll just chalk it up? Uh, we had Gaza. It was a big part of our strategy for years, but now that's gone. Now we need to refocus our energies. Do they do that? Or do they say, you know what, Hamas is, and Gaza in general, it's too valuable for us to lose, to not be in the Iranian orbit, to not be a part of that Iranian ring of fire that surrounds Israel on all sides? And do they also say, wow, if Hamas and Islamic Jihad in Gaza are utterly destroyed, it makes us, meaning Iran and Hezbollah, look weak. So they've got some decisions to make. But I believe the decisions are also being made in Israel's war cabinet right now about saying, you know, Hezbollah next. And that's the greater threat. And everyone knows it's the greater threat. So just as I believe Hamas signed its own death warrant on October 7th, I believe Hezbollah may very well be in the process of doing that as well with its own terror operations. We shall see, and I believe we shall see sooner rather than later, what will become of the situation in the North. In the meantime, quick mention before we go, and I mentioned this at the top, the United States, U.S. forces in Iraq and Syria attacked four times in the past 24 hours by these Iranian-backed forces in Iraq and Syria under the direct orders, no doubt, of the Iranian regime. That brings it to around 50, I believe, 
maybe a few more, maybe a few less with these new numbers added in, times that U.S. forces have been attacked since October 7th. Now, the U.S. has responded on a few occasions with airstrikes mainly along in eastern Syria, along the Syria-Iraq border. And they've killed some terrorists there, no doubt, including six over the weekend in an airstrike, Iran-backed terrorists. But folks, what the U.S. has done has just not been enough to deter Iran. Clearly, it's not to the point where Iran says, wow, the U.S. means business, and the price we are going to pay for directing attacks against U.S. forces in the region is too great a price to pay. We're going to back off. We're not at that point yet. Again, the question I've had with these shows of force by the U.S., two aircraft carrier groups in the Mediterranean, a nuclear sub in the Mediterranean, et cetera, does Iran believe there's teeth behind it? Look, some airstrikes here and there, uh, bombing factories here and there. Uh, okay, is that enough to deter your enemy? And right now it seems like it's not because the attacks are actually intensifying. So Iran is playing with fire, folks, and they've been playing with fire, the Iranian regime, essentially for some 44 years since the outset of the Iran, rarely since the outset of the Iranian revolution, rarely has Iran paid the consequences and paid the price for its actions. But right now, if they lose some of their most lethal proxies in the form of Hezbollah and Hamas, you may finally see accountability come across the desk of the Supreme Leader of Iran. And Iran will finally feel the squeeze. This, in a normal sane world, what Iran has done here, and look, October 7th doesn't happen without Iran's active support, training, and encouragement. His fingerprints were all over that day. But if this doesn't reset things and change the entire calculus towards Iran by Western leaders, then I throw my hands up. Because if it's going to be, continue to be now, even after what we've seen over the past six weeks, the appeasement strategy towards the Iranian regime, trying to bring Iran to the table for some grand bargain, some grand deal, then the West is more lost than I even believe. So continuing to pray for wisdom for the leaders here in the West vis-a-vis -vis the Iranian regime and how to handle that problem, how to hold this regime accountable. And finally, that they face consequences for the evil that they have wrought throughout the region. But we shall see. Hey, stay in prayer. Pray. If there's one thing I've learned in my life, folks, it's that prayer works. And continue to keep the hostages in your prayers in particular and their families and pray for that miraculous hostage rescue. I hope I can come here on the live stream one day in the very new, near future on the newscast and say, folks, do you believe it? Look at what God did. The hostages have come home. The captives have been set free. I'm praying for that day. I'm praying for it very, very soon. Hey, thanks so much for joining us here today on the Watchman Newscast live stream. Until tomorrow, God bless you. And remember, never. Hold your peace. Hey, everyone. Thanks for checking out the Watchman Newscast. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so you never miss an upload. And tap the bell icon so you're notified every time a new video is posted. And don't forget to share your thoughts, insights, and comments below. Thanks for watching. We'll see you back here tomorrow.